In order to understand process monitoring, there's one other quantity for PCA that we haven't yet looked at. We've looked at the scores, we've looked at the loadings, we've looked at the SPE, but there's one other uh, particular value called Hotelling's T-squared that, that comes up in PCA. And what Hotelling's T-squared is, is nothing more than a summary of the scores. So we summarized our data X with a certain number of scores capital A. When we've chosen capital A by cost validation or by our own judgment of how many components we want to use. We can go summarize those A values down even further to a single column, which we call Hotelling's T squared. Okay? So we're taking these T, these A columns from the T matrix and reducing them down even further to one column. Similar, it's very similar in the way that we took our data X, okay? And after calculating T1 and P1, we were able to then calculate a residual matrix E, subscript one, in, uh, E1, E1, which are the residuals after calculating X. And then we took each row from the residual matrix and we calculated a single column, which we call this one. So we summarized our residuals down, our entire column of K residuals, down to a single number by taking the sum of squares of the residuals. Hotelling's T squared is doing something similar. We're taking our, our A scores and we're going to summarize them down by a single number, Hotelling's T squared. So by the end of this, we can take every row from X, and for every row, we can summarize it in, in the two numbers. We can create an SPE column, and we can create a T-squared column. Okay? So every one of these columns is just a single number that summarizes that entire row from X. And those two numbers are totally independent of each other. I'll show that next. SPE, we already know the interpretation of SPE as the distance from the model plane to the point that is represented by this vector x. So this vector represents the point off the plane, some, some data point floating above or below the loadings. SPE represents the distance from that point to the projection onto the plane. T squared will show now is the distance from the origin to the projection on the plane. Okay, so that's a mouthful, but I'll show you a picture of it. So the way we calculate T squared is quite straightforward. We say, take for the i row in matrix T, for the i uh, observation, here's my matrix T with A columns, take the i row, take the score, one, A is equal to one up to capital A. So take the T1 value for the i row, divide through by the standard deviation for the eighth score. So if that matrix T exists there, we've got a column T1, that's just the first column from this matrix. Okay, we can go calculate the standard deviation on T1. Or another way of saying that that's uh, we're actually squaring it here, so you can say use the variance then is S subscript A squared is the variance of T1. And the variance of T1, remember from last class, that's exactly the quantity we're trying to maximize. When we derive the optimization approach for eigenvalues, we show that the objective function in that derivation was PCA's first component for S one, that variance, that's the, what we're trying to maximize. So that's a useful number to, to know. It's the variance of the first component which we've maximized. So simply take the score value for every row and divide through by um, that, that variance. So the square, square the value divided through by variance, and then we repeat that for column one, two, three, four. So the sum of squares of the scores divided through by the corresponding variables. And another way to, to interpret that is we know that variance for the first score, so 
the variance for the first score is greater than the variance for the second score, which is greater than the variance for the third score, and so on. Every subsequent score, T1, T2, T3, has smaller and smaller variance by definition of, of what the uh, PCA is doing. So dividing through by that variance makes later components, uh, brings later components and scales them up. We're dividing through by a smaller number as A gets bigger and bigger. So we're upscaling later components to basically bring all, all our components, one, two, three, up to capital A, to equal level, and then we're summing them up. That's another way to, to see it. So we're, we're normalizing every component so that when we form the summation, every component has the same degree of influence in calculating t squared. That would be another way to, to describe it. You can also see that geometrically. Okay, I'll, I'll illustrate that to, to you in a minute geometrically. So by that equation, it's clear that every t squared value must be a number greater than or equal to zero. And if the row order in your data set makes any sense, like if your row order or the time stamps uh, or that sequence of in, in your data set means something to you, then plotting t squared here now, we, we calculate from this, we calculate t squared. And if I plot that as a time series, the patterns in that time series plot may mean something to me. Okay. I'll, I'll come back to that figure in a minute. Okay, so geometrically, what t squared is saying, it's, let's take this data point, it's on the model plane over here, that's the projection of that data point on the model plane, given by p1, p2. t squared is the distance from the origin to the projection on the plane. Distance from the center point, uh, from the, uh, that should be the model center, would be the correct way of saying, just direct distance from the model center to where the point is projected on the plane. So for every data point, we can calculate that directed distance. Points that are close to the center obviously have t squared close to zero. The further away we go, but on the model plane, so it's the projection of the point onto the plane, the further out that projection is on the plane, the larger the t squared value becomes for that particular row. Now, one thing to bear in mind is we're often interested in masking. Here's a, here's a point that's way out over here. It's got a large t squared value. Compare it back to this point over here, which has a relatively small t squared value. Where we're going with more process monitoring and with interpreting models is we often want to know how big is too big. How do we know that this point is an outlier? Like how far do we have to go away from the center before we say, aha, that point's an outlier? Okay, that's where we're going at. And one way to answer those types of questions is to look at confidence intervals. So I, I am assuming that you, that you know what confidence intervals are and how to use them, as well as basic statistical distributions. If that's something you're not comfortable with, uh, it's something that you do need to review, and uh, you can email me and I can point you to some references. But you don't need to know why, but we can just use the fact in this particular course. If we were in the math building, I would be explaining how this happens. If we're in the engineering building, so we can just believe it. But t squared is, has an f distribution. And if we know that, we can go to a table or software and just say, well, at what point does my f distribution exceed 95%? And that would a point beyond the 95% confidence limit, we would say, is a large point. Okay, a point below the 95% limit would be relatively small. So we can go look up from tables what that 95% limit is for t squared, and that is then often drawn onto this plot of t1, t2 to, to describe where the outliers fall. So here we, here we have an example of that. I've, I've calculated my T1 and T2 values. Every point here is a, yeah, 
Sorry, this is a quick question. Why are you calling it an outlier? Couldn't it just be mean something's changed? Yeah, we'll come back to that, that distinction in a minute. For t squared, it's a, it's a subtlety. But you, you're, you're, you're right, it's not necessarily an outlier. Okay. Um, so t1, t2 values for every data point here, there's about 400 odd data points shown on that score plot. The equation for t squared, remember we said it's given by the sum of squares. So t squared is given by t1 squared divided through by the variance of that first component plus t2 squared divided through the variance of the second component. Here I'm plotting on my x-axis is t1, on my y-axis is t2. If I know what the 95% limit is for, for that, so, so I can go find that limit, the 95% limit from tables, that is the equation of an ellipse. It's some constant is equal to the usual equation of an ellipse that you, you may recall from math is something along these lines. This equation over here has exactly that same structure. Some constant limit, this is our 95% limit for t squared, is equal to the x value squared and then a. Okay, so, t1 squared divided by some constant variance plus t2 squared divided by its constant variance. t1 and t2, then, if we vary those values, that is nothing more than plotting the equation of the ellipse. So the green line is the 95% limit, the red line is the 99% limit. That is the equation of an ellipse. Which, right now, it's not, it's not a detail that you have to thoroughly understand. It's just, I want you to see where these values come from in the software. Don't just believe what, or just take for granted what the software puts out there for you. So when the software is displaying these elliptical limits, that is the point at which 95% and 99% of the values lie. Uh, just coming back here to this particular plot for Hotelix T squared. I can now show it in a different way. I can calculate my Hotelix T squared value for every data point. So data point one, two, three, four, up to 400. Every point that's their Hotelix T squared. And then superimpose the 95% limit and the 99% limit onto that. The one, it, it's a bit of a weird concept to think about, but what those limits represent in the T1, T2 plot is if I take that same plot, that limit here, if I took that and I unwrapped it, those, those green lines and the red lines correspond exactly to the same green and red lines you see over here. Okay. A point that happens to fall on the green line here at the 95% limit will fall on the 95% elliptical limit as well. Now, one thing to, to appreciate here with, when we're talking about limits, uh, let's just take this axis over here, and there's my 99% limit. And here's roughly it's my 95% limit. Okay. If I took these 460 data points and I plotted the distribution for them, I, and I'm going to put this distribution on the side, the bulk of the distribution lies here, and then it, it uh, tails off like that. So the 99% limit says for normal data with no real special outliers, 1% of my values will lie in that tail and 5% of the values will lie in region from 95 to infinity. So that's all, all that these, these confidence limits do. They're just capturing the region of, um, or the amount of data within the distribution. So that's something you should be comfortable with from, from confidence limits, okay? All that maybe is new here is the fact that Hotelling's T squared is distributed according to an F distribution. 
And once we know that, we can just go look up from tables the corresponding 95 or 99 percent values for that distribution, which the software does for you. So you don't have to do it yourself, but I just wanted to show where those numbers are coming from in the software, those ellipses. The way we can, the way the, the, the correct relationship for the limit, if you wanted to go write your own software, is as follows, n minus 1 times n plus 1 times a, the number of components divided through by n, n minus a, multiplied through by the f distribution value at, say, 95 or 99% alpha, with a and n minus a increase of frequency. So you just go look those values up, and that will get you your corresponding t squared value. Where a is your number of components, n is your number of observations. And just so that you're aware, t squared has these other two names that's used in the literature. Not, not that much. Um, on times, t squared is the most common way it's referred to, but it's also referred to as the Mahalanobis distance, uh, named after a famous Indian mathematician or the D statistic. Okay. Uh, corresponding to the D statistic, the SPE is sometimes called the Q statistic. So this is what you, if you're reading journal articles and they're referring to the D and the Q statistics, D refers to its own T squared, Q refers to SPE. other limits that we just need to quickly look at before we move on to process monitoring. And those are the limits for the scores. Now, the scores, T1, T2, etc. Let's take a data set. And if I plot T1 over here on a, on a, um, a time series plot, let's say there's my T1 value for the first observation, for the second observation, third, fourth, fifth, etc. I can plot my T1 values so, so on. Let's say these all come from a data set where there's no real outliers. The question I want to ask is what is a large T1 value? For example, if I if I got a T1 value over here, would I consider that an outlier? What might your initial response, your initial answer to that question be? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Over there? Yes. Definitely. Over here, maybe. And that's exactly what confidence limits help us try and find out. Is when is a maybe a yes or a no? Okay, so what a 95% confidence limit is for a really large data set with no outliers. So if, we, if, we, if we're reasonably confident our data set is fairly clean and, and not contaminated by outliers, the easiest way to calculate confidence limits is simply to take the data from our model, form the histogram for it, which will be centered at, at, at zero. There's my zero point. T1 has always got a mean of zero. And I can simply go take the point over there, two and a half percent, two and a half percent. So those two tails form 95, uh, form five percent of the distribution's area. Inside contains 95 percent. Okay. So I should have a few more data points out here to match those. So let's say I've got a thousand data points. I would expect 5% of my data points to lie outside the 95% limits, naturally. Okay. So for a thousand data points, I'm saying what's nine, 950 are inside, and then 25 would be above. 25 below. So 25 data points would fall above my 2.5% line. 25 data points would fall below that point. 950 data points would fall within that range. If, 
and I'm not making any assumption here, right? I'm not making, I'm not saying that this, these T's are normally distributed. I simply go take my data, my thousand data points, and I sort them from highest to lowest, and I come down and I find the point at which 25 data points lie. That point is my 95% limit, uh, sorry, my, my upper limit, and then I keep going down and the point at which I've got only 25 data points left in my data set, the low end, that's my lower limit. I don't have to make any assumption that these data are normally distributed. They could be any, from any distribution. The reason why I can do that is because I've got such a large body of data to work with, I can just simply sort the data and use its histogram to find those limits. That's one, and that we, we use that regularly for the large data set work. We don't have to make any sort of distributional assumption. No one has to say that these points are normally distributed or any other distribution. Okay. So just, just to emphasize, and this is my zero point, so I'm gonna refer back to that next here. We could, of course, go make it, yeah, sorry, point of In the middle, the watch file, all the Sorry? In this case, you know, the loss of all the data, T1, B2, B3, or whatever, the T8. Okay, yeah, I could go repeat this for every score. I'm just taking one score, let's say T1. And I can, what I want to, I might, like I, I was saying, I have a question. What is, is a data point over here? I had a point over here. I'm asking, is that an outlier? Yes or no? It lies just beyond the 95% limit. So, yeah, I can say it's, it's likely not an outlier, but it's a, certainly a point that I, I might want to go investigate. Whereas a point over here lies well beyond the 95% limit. But remember, initially, I didn't know where this horizontal line was. The question we're, we're, I'm trying to answer is, one way I can go find where to place that limit line is simply take my data, sort it from highest to lowest, and find the two and a half percent tail cutoffs in the data, and then draw my limit lines at those points. For a large body of data, that's a perfectly valid way to go find the confidence limits. But in many cases, we don't have such a large body of data. We can't just go do that. We have to make certain assumptions. And for the scores, T1, T2, T3, a very reasonable assumption is to say that they're normally distributed, centered at zero, with, me, uh, with the standard deviation of S subscript A, where S A is the standard deviation of, of that score. Okay. And that is a reasonable assumption because of the central limit theorem. So back to, to undergraduate courses we learned what the central limit theorem was about. It says that if we take values and independently add them up, that added value is normally distributed. And that's exactly what T is doing. So if we go look for TA, it says take my X1 value, multiplied by P11. So let's just work with this first called T1, plus X2 times P21, and so on. So I, my P's are fixed, and I'm just taking this value x1 multiplied by a scaling factor plus x2 multiplied by a scaling factor. I'm, I'm summing up points. I didn't have to make any assumption of the distribution of x's. But I do know that once I add this, add these scale terms, t1 will be distributed according to the normal distribution with mean of zero and variance or given by SA or standard deviation like from the central limit here. So it's a very reasonable assumption to do, uh, to make rather, and if you, if you make that assumption, you can calculate TA and you plot the histogram of it, you will mostly see that the, the scores are not distributed. So that, it's, it's about ways we can validate that. The other key point I want to mention is some people go around saying PCA only works on if your data is normally distributed, that is not true. We, may, we never make any assumption of what these X's need to be. X's can come from any distribution. They can be 
f distributed, they can be uh, normally distributed, they could be integer variables going 0, 1, 2, 3, it doesn't matter. We make absolutely no assumption of what x is on. But by the central limit theorem, the moment we start to go add these terms together, the addition of them, t1, will be normally distributed. Okay. And given that assumption, then we can go calculate the limits from the t distribution at a over 2, uh, alpha divided by 2, and the corresponding degrees of freedom, multiplied through by the standard deviation. So that gives us, um, for example, if I, I can go, multi let's say I want my 95% limit, I go take my 95% alpha divided by 2, and I'm splitting it across the two tails. My degrees of freedom is n minus 1, multiplied through by the standard deviation. That's, that's from uh, the classical uh, derivation that we cover in 4C3, for example. So that says my 95% limit can be easily calculated once I know uh, my T value, which I simply look up on the table. So quick recap, Jake, you took 4C3. Charlene, 4C3 people. From that, from that, here's my normal distribution. How much of my data lies outside, let's say that point is one sigma. How much of my data lies outside the plus and minus one sigma range? Sixty-six, sixty-seven, roughly seventy percent of my data lies within one standard deviation. Okay? So I can go put that alpha in over there, 67, uh, minus that from 100, divided by 2, plug that in over there, I know my degrees of freedom, get my t value from my table of t values, multiply that by the standard deviation for t1, and that will find me that bound, that upper and lower bound. If I wanted 95%, that's roughly two standard deviations, I would do the same thing. There's two standard deviations. Three standard deviations. The wider I make that, uh, sorry, the larger I make that confidence limit, the wider it becomes. So your scores then, you can either use a large reference data set or you can use a statistical assumption to derive it. Similarly for SPE, um, we can go follow the same approach. I can go plot my SPE values and form a distribution, find the point at which 5% is above a certain limit, and then form my 95% limit for SPE. Or I can go use a statistical assumption that SPE is chi-squared distributed. We won't cover that in this, in this class, but SPE to a good approximation can be considered chi-squared distributed. And Nolikos and McGregor derived uh, that, the limits of that distribution in that paper. If you're interested in so the, the purpose of this discussion is just to put it out there. When you see these limits on, on the score plot, on your T1, T2 plot, you've got your ellipse. On your score plot, we've got plus and minus. So you've got your zero point and you've got plus and minus confidence limits. On your SPE plot, you've got got a limit, those can all be derived in, um, from statistical assumptions. Okay. Any, any quick questions on that before we move on? It's pretty, uh, pretty clear there. So let's move on to process monitoring and I'll just uh, we'll talk a bit about it. I'm going to skip over some of the slides that I feel, uh, I had a lot of slides in here which I covered in, in 4C3. I, I'm going to skip over some of those because arguably 4C3 is a prerequisite for this course and also uh, it's not really going to, if I skip over them, you're, you're not going to miss out anything from today's class. So, so don't be uh, alarmed if we jump over a few slides. But I do want to just put monitoring in perspective of an analogy of monitoring your health. The reason for that is because it's a, it's a very good approximation to what we're doing when we're monitoring the process. So you know yourself when you're feeling healthy and everything's going well. So most of us, we're all young, we're feeling great, and 
you, you've got a good feeling of, of when you wake up in the morning that, that everything's okay with your body. Uh, the moment though you start to feel any pain, or let's say lack of mobility, or it's really hard to breathe, you've detected a problem. Okay? Nine times out of 10 for health, for a human's health, when a problem occurs, you feel some form of pain. That's usually the first indication of a problem, is some form of pain. That's the detection. You detect a problem. Okay. Now, if something we say in, in the terminology of process monitoring, we say that there's a special cause. There's something that's gone on inside this complicated system here that's not normal. There's a special reason for it. Something's changed. And after detecting the problem, the next step is to try and diagnose it. So you can either do that yourself, based on your previous experience. Growing up since a young kid, you've, you've learned to figure out what you should believe and what you shouldn't believe about your body. And it becomes especially true as you become an adult, where like arthritis or other pains become a normal part of your lifestyle. You can quickly identify the difference between what's a normal pain and what's an abnormal pain. Like if I go work out at the gym or if I do gardening or I'm painting the house and I'm doing this up and down, this is part's going to get sore by the end of the day. Yeah, I've detected it, I can diagnose it, but I'm not going to take any special action. Certain actions though, once we, uh, so, sorry, certain problems, once we diagnose them, do require action. They require a visit to ER or to the doctor taking some medication, or getting a brace for your arm, or seeing a physiotherapist. Something to try and fix the problem and get back to your usual state. Okay? That's the same approach we take with uh, process monitoring. We want to detect the problem, diagnose it, and then fix it. Okay? And, the, and it's no surprise then that companies that, that sell software for process monitoring, they, they go by the names of process doctor, health monitoring system. They use this concept of health monitoring because it's a good analogy for understanding a chemical process. When we want to monitor a chemical process, we follow exactly the same procedure, detection, diagnosis, and fixing. Okay. Now, some terminology you have to be aware of. If, let's make the assumption that you go to a doctor and the doctor's always right. That may not always be true, but let's assume for now the doctor's always right, and your baseline hypothesis is that you're healthy. So I now detect a problem. I wake up one morning and I find it really hard to breathe. I've got chest pain and I'm struggling to take a deep breath. I go to the doctor who is always right, and the doctor says there's nothing wrong with you, go home. Okay. I've raised a false alarm. I thought. I, I, my hypothesis I'm healthy, I feel something is wrong, I raise an alarm, I go visit the doctor, the doctor does the, the diagnosis, nothing's wrong, even though I felt I'm outside my normal limits of what, what's, what's okay and what isn't, the, the truth is that I really am healthy. So I've raised a false alarm, it's also called a type one error. So it's when you raise an alarm and it really isn't a problem. It's, it's called a type one error. And this is one of the most uh, important errors to be aware of. Because in a, a monitoring system that raises type 1 errors frequently, is a monitoring system that's going to be turned off right away by the operators. A company will not tolerate a system that continually raises type 1 errors. I, I know in my company, there's a computer in the basement that I was walking past the other day. And it was beeping once every 15 seconds, roughly. And every beep is supposed to be an alarm. No one looks at that computer anymore. They, in fact, they've got a long list up on the wall next to it saying, if this alarm is raised, ignore it. And it's a list of like 20 different alarms which should be ignored. <laughs> so what's the purpose of that monitoring system, right? There's, there's no reason for it. It's, it's going to be ignored or, or turned off. Okay, so that's a type one error. The type two error is, is, is a little different. This one is, you feel okay, but you go to the doctor, let's say for your annual annual checkup. You feel within your limits, but the doctor, after doing some tests or whatever, says you're not healthy. That's a type two error. When you don't raise an alarm, when you should have, 
when there really is a problem in the process, but you don't raise an alarm, that's a type 2 error. Uh, that's also a bad error, because in this case, something's going wrong, but you're going around believing that nothing is wrong. You're making bad product, maybe, without knowing that you're making bad products. So your customers are going to suffer. In the first case, here for type 1 error, you're going to suffer as a company because you're going to stop the process and say, oh, this product I'm making is bad, I need to scrap it, when really, no, it's, it's perfectly okay. So the type 1 error, the person suffering is the, the company that's making the product. In a type 2 error, the person suffering is the consumer. Okay? And there's also a little grid that you can often draw where we say, Here's the truth, and here's, uh, here's, your, alarm, here's your alarm system. Okay, and so the truth is, uh, I'm saying I'm in control, or I'm out of control. That's great. This is, this is where you want to be. You want to be in a process where everything's going normal and where the truth is that you really are normal. If you're out of control, if you really are out of control, so something is abnormal and your alarm system detects that you're abnormal, that's also okay. It's not a desirable state, but it's something that you can, you can do something about. It. And you can try and get yourself back to that position by fixing the problem. Which one of these two boxes is a type 1 error and which is a type 2 error? Type 1 or type 2? Okay, type 2 error is when you don't raise an alarm, you think you're in control when you're really out of control. Type 1 error is that case, when you think you're out of control or abnormal, but you really are okay. okay. You want to minimize both of these. You want low values of type 2 errors and low values of type 1 errors, always. You don't want to cause either situation to, okay. that would be the best, the best situation to have low values of type 1 and type 2 error. And unfortunately, we can never have both. We can always trade off between them. We can never have a problem. Okay. So I want you to have that analogy in mind. I'm going to skip over these few slides because they're not quite now. We'll definitely come back to them in a later class. Okay. And we'll resume here and then just cover a few more slides and then get to the software. So the major monitoring chart we will use is a Shewark chart. Uh, it comes from the 1920s, and it's a chart for monitoring location or stability of the process. The way it works is fairly straightforward, which is why this chart is so widely used in industry. So you'll see this nine times out of ten when there's a monitoring system in place in the company, it will be a Shuar chart because it's so straightforward, anyone can understand it. Let's say there's a certain temperature that, you, that you're monitoring. This temperature, TC241, is a temperature that really needs to stay at 10 degrees C in order to produce good quality product. You've identified that in your company as a critical variable, so you monitor it. So it's tank temperature 241. There's a target of 10 degrees, so this center line is the target line. And we'll have an upper control limit and a lower control limit shown there in red. And the principle of the chart is that as long as you're moving inside these limits, you take no action. The moment you see something trending out, that's when you need to go investigate the alarm and do something about it. The reason why you take no action if you're inside those limits is 
if you did go take an action, let's say I was over there and I go take an action, by taking that action, you're actually introducing variability into your process. And that's something we don't want to do. We don't want to go add changes or upsets to our process that really are not necessary. These bounds we're saying are, as long as we're within these bounds, this is the normal range of variation I'm willing to accept. Coming back to the health monitoring, this is the normal level of aches and pains I'm willing to endure as a person before I go see the doctor. I'm not going to go visit anyone or, or try and seek help for my problem until I reach a certain threshold. Okay. So, again, if we make a type 1 error, we're going to say a type 1 error is when we plot a value outside those limits when we really um, should be inside. We're, we're saying we're in normal operation, but I'm going to raise an alarm it's a false alarm. The type 2 error is when the value is from abnormal operation, but it happens to fall within the limits. Okay. Just a quick discussion then on monitoring charts as they're used by most companies. Let's say you're monitoring this process. It's the tank temperature. It's a big tank that's producing a product. Let's say it's a reactor. What would you do if you see this sort of behavior going on over here? Is the sensor okay? And, and let's say we're, this is a reliable sensor. So, so that, that's an excellent point, yeah. That's often something that's not done in practice. First validate that your sense is okay. Let's say it is, what might you do next? Maybe turn off like the input to the tank. Turn off the input to the tank? If, if you know that that input to the tank is, like a high is, is a cause for that, right here. Yeah. Uh, any, any other suggestions, Matt? Couldn't you monitor the rate of, so if it was within a certain range of the upper or lower bound, you could monitor the rate of change of that variable. So if it was moving towards that upper bound at a fast rate, then you could then maybe adjust your uh, heater or whatever. That rate of change might in fact be another monitoring chart that you choose to look at. So you could have two monitoring charts in, in parallel, one that shows the plot and then one that shows the rate of change of the plot. And yeah, so that's great. If you know a certain problem is due to a rapid increase in heat, that would be a really good point. Anything else here? Yeah. Is it Kaluki Ash? I can't remember if it was the Kaluki Ash. I require that if you remove the Lambanica Ash, that could be adjusted with the message something, and then it could be cool or? Right, yeah, it could be an outlier. I would say that's similar to what Janet suggested. Like, check your sensor to make sure that it's not an outlier or a problem that's occurred. Good, yeah. Any other suggestions? Sorry? Turn the cooling on. Turn the cooling on? Okay, so maybe, but conversely, why is this going up? Because the cooling system that should be on this controlled temperature, this is TC as a controlled temperature, something's failed in the cooling system. Okay? Well, the key point I want to get across is that there's multiple problems that can occur in the process to see the same problem. Right? This, this is not. A unique, there's no unique answer of what's causing this. The problem could be due to any multitude of factors and you need external information on the process too. You need to know your process and what might cause those problems in order to determine, okay, that's, a, that's due to problem X. But a different problem in your process can lead to the same upward trend and the same violation of that, that limit. So there's no unique relationship between the problem and the signal that you see over there. Obviously, if data goes missing, you can't do anything about it. You, you, your monitoring plot just goes offline. You, you, you have no, no numbers. And then, this is the final point I'll make, and then we'll, we'll start to look at the software. The problem is when you monitor two univariate variables, is you can make a big mistake. Firstly, what is the relationship between those two? Yeah. Uh, like, squinting at it. <laughs> yeah, 
if you look at it hard enough, you can see that there's an inverse relationship between those two variables. One goes up, the other goes down. Let's say this is my polymer strength, and this is the amount I can stretch it by. So if strength goes up, I can stretch it by a smaller amount. If, if I can stretch it by a really large amount, it means that it's a, 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 the strength is decreased of the polymer. So two variables that are, are correlated in some way. In this case, they've got a negative correlation. Now, this is just two variables, but in most processes, we've got hundreds of these important variables. And there's no way you can have one person sit and look at a computer screen of all these charts and see and wait for them to go out of, out of their limits. The first thing you might all say, those of you that are in the MACC as well, yeah, I can automate it. I can put a computer system to monitor the monitoring charts to see when they go out of the limits, right? Yeah, you could. but. Even that won't work for a reason I'll show you next. Okay. If I plot those two traject uh, those two plots, and I show you the intersection of it, the joint scatter plot, you can clearly see the negative relationship, the negative correlation between the strength of the plastic and the stretchability. Okay. But notice this point here, observation number ten. Observation 10 had low strength, and observation 10 over here I plotted, so this goes 1, 2, 3, up to 50, I think it is. So here's observation 10. And this value over here has low stretchability and low strength. Okay. Whereas the usual relationship between <coughs> the strength and stretchability is that they're negatively correlated. This particular point violates that relationship. That ellipse over there, it is a Hotelling's ellipse. We can derive Hotelling's t squared ellipse for, um, for normal variables as well. Clearly shows that that point is outside the Hotelling's ellipse limit. So if you were monitoring these plots one at a time, so here's variable x1, I'm saying that's in control, everything is normal. This particular observation here, is within my limits, everything is normal. You, I know like in my company, every batch of drugs we produce, the people in QA, quality control, or QC, they go look at this and say, it's within the, in the, within the limits above and below, it's within the limits above and below, stamp, approve, sell it to customers. But never do they look at the variables two at a time or three at a time to try and find these outliers. Because in this case, for plastics, if I go sell this product to my customer, for sure it will fail on that, my customer's process. Because in the past, he's, that my customer has bought products from me that follow this relationship. Now I'm sending my customer a batch of materials where that point is a huge outlier. But univariately, from the perspective of X1, from the perspective of X2, that point is not an outlier within the plus and minus three sigma limits. Okay. So even if you had a system in place to monitor your control charts one variable at a time, it wouldn't work for this reason over here. Because it's in the limits, it's in the limits, it's still an outline. Okay. And you know what? This is for two variables. Now, take a look at the case where there's three variables. If I get my are the control limits, the plus and minus control limits. So every axis here, that's the up and lower bound for x2, up and lower bound for x1, <coughs> up and lower bound for x3. Okay, see how much white space there is in that box. The, if I had to univariately go say, as long as my data point is within inside those limits of x1, within the limits of x2, within the limits of x3, there's so much space that that point can lie with within, univariately from the perspective of each axis. But multivariately, we know that those points should lie 
in the zone of the black points. The blue points are clearly outliers. The blue points are clearly different from the black points. And you can see that in this particular snapshot of the data. But those blue points lie within, inside the outline, outline of the tolerance of x1, x2, x3. And the problem just gets worse and worse the moment you start adding a fourth and a fifth and a sixth variable. You get so much space where you can lie within and still be within your limits, but multivariately you're not within your limits. Okay. So what would these blue points, if I built a multivariate model for x1, x2, x3, how would I pick up the blue points as being unusual? The prediction error. The squared prediction error, right? So the first component would go through this direction over here. And if I just fit one component to that data set, the blue points would have a huge SPE. They'd stick out. Okay? So that's the, that's the first monitoring plot we look at when we look at multivariate plots is we fit our model to the data, and then we look at the SPE. Any distance off the model plane is an outlier. What is another point we can look at? Another statistic we can look at? We can look at T squared would be another one. So T squared would be, if this is the center of my model, and the first component goes in this direction, T squared would tell how far along that line I am. And so a very high t squared value will, will also be an indicator that something is unusual. Maybe not something wrong, but definitely something's unusual. Okay? So t squared and SPE are the two numbers we're going to focus on. So uh, um, let's take a look. I think it's a good point to just switch to the software so we can do something a bit different other than me talking, talking, talking. And I'll, we can actually take a look at some of this. Okay, so if you, if you open the software packages and then uh, load the LDPE data set, you'll look at the LDPE data set first, and try to see how it applies. exothermic reaction. So as it's traveling, this is the temperature profile along the reactor. 
this Tn at the beginning, temperature goes up and up and up. It's a very, very exothermic reaction. So to cool it down, we have cooling water flowing counter current. <coughs> so cooling water at some midpoint in the, um, along the tubing is entering over here. So the cooling coil wraps around the reactor, flowing counter current will cool that down. So it's at some point along this distance over here, some point Z1 is the percentage of the distance along the reactor is the point where we record the maximum temperature. From that point onward, the temperature profile decreases. Okay. Until we get to the outlet of the first section of the reactor. Then, at some midpoint along the reactor, we actually feed in some more solvent, some more initiator at a, at a, at a temperature. And so that what causes that sudden drop in the temperature profile. The temperature profile drops there because it's suddenly receiving a shock of lower temperature reactants coming in. Keeps flowing down the length of the reactor, which is again cooled in a counter current manner by a second counter current stream, which comes in at TCN2. We reach a maximum temperature along a certain distance across the, the profile that cools down to reach the outlet temperature. So those are the variables that are in, in your data set. You've got all these variables. The flow rates of the initiator and the solvents, the inlet temperature. You've got this distance Z1. I think it's, it's actually not a distance, it's the percentage. So it's like a number of 0 0.03. It says that that maximum temperature occurs at 3% of the distance along the reactor length. Z2 is numbers around 57, 58% because it's just after the halfway mark. Then we also have, also have the pressure reported along the reactor. Okay, so those are the variables we're dealing with. Let's take a look then what PCA is showing on that data set. Right, so there's our temperatures, Z1, Z2, flow rates. Oh, I forgot to talk about the last five columns. When this material comes out of the reactor, so there's the end, we take a sample and send it to the lab, and we measure those five variables. The conversion of the reactants, the number of average molecular weight, weight average molecular weight, long chain branching, short chain branching. Those are our five parameters on the outlet. The, in, the, the other, um, just to put it in perspective of where this data set is coming from, these values over here, the temperatures and the flow rates, they're obviously measured at a very high frequency, once per minute. The lab values are measured much, much later. But this data set that we've got here for, for you now is where these data have been aligned up so that within an observation, those were the temperature profiles and the flow rates and so on that produced the outlet product that was sent to the lab at that time. So normally though, the lab data is available much less frequently than the process data. For now though, that's not too much of an issue. We'll deal with that when we come to prediction models. But for, for now though, we're just gonna build a monitoring model and take a look at what's, what's going on. Okay, so click OK to go to the next uh, block. Finish that up. And you can, you can go look at each variable over here, if you like. You can see some interesting patterns going on here. But for now, we're going to just, we, we don't know too much about this data, so we're just going to go investigate from a monitoring perspective. Save that. Okay, so they're my variables, and they're, they're my observations. Now, what I do want you to go do though for, for this exercise is to exclude observations 51 to 54. And the reason is, when we build a monitoring model, we need to build a monitoring model and calculate the limits for normal process behavior. I know for a fact that observations 51 and 54 are from when a problem occurred with my process. Those observations should not be included in the model when we build the model, okay? 
we should exclude those observations and build the model only on the first 50 rows which represent normal on range locations. Because then the hotel T squared limits, the SPE limits, and the other limits in the process model will be for normal, reasonable operation. And we should see that these observations appear as above the limit. Okay, so for, for the first go, let's just go exclude those observations. Later on, in the next exercise, we'll see um, a case where we don't know anything. We want the model to tell us where the outliers are, and then we'll We'll exclude them, rebuild, exclude, rebuild. But for now, let's just start with a simple case where I'm telling you these are the outliers. Let's go ahead and exclude them. 51 to 54. So exclude those. And you can just say this is my base monitoring model. So let's leave it at that, four components. Um, the reason for that is we're just going to look at the first two uh, uh, for now and then we'll look at the components we So let's go take a look at the score plot, T1, T2. There's no points that lie outside of those particular, uh, those con well, there's two over here, 8 and 33, but none, none that lie outside my 99. I wouldn't consider those two points outliers just yet. Um, I can certainly go investigate them, uh, and we actually will go investigate them in a minute. Let's take a look also at our T squared. Remember, we've got four components max log, so Vitalik's T squared then is a summary of those four, four scores. Analyze Vitalik's T squared and go from one to four, say okay. And you can zoom that up. So here's your 95% Vitalik's limit, your 99% Vitalik's limit. It's Vitalik's T squared is a one sided monitor chart with a minimum of zero going up. And finally, we go look at SPE. We're, we're just examining the, the model building data. So square prediction error. We're going to use four components to calculate the SPE. So it's showing us what the residual distances are after using four components. Say OK. And we see a couple of unusual points above that over there. So there's our 95 and 99 I won't go investigate those points just yet, but I, I will go investigate some SPE points in a minute to show you how we, how we go check why they're outliers. But what I do want to uh, just show you is how we now use this model. Remember, we've excluded points 51 to 54. I'm interested in showing you how to use the model to monitor the process. Let's, let's pr presume that we build this model now, we go apply it online, and we want to go see how the monitoring model might pick up the problems with the process. That's the first step, to detect the problem. And then the second step is we're going to look at how we can diagnose the problem. So to do that in the software, you, you must first go up to um, edit, and you specify a prediction set. And click on this drop down over here, create a new prediction set, you have to actually click on it, and then it pops up a new window asking you to give your prediction set a name. What I want to do now, this is, this is not a normal approach for a prediction set, but what I, I want to just do here is I'm going to use all my data in the prediction set, right from observation one 
up to 54. The reason why I'm going through that is so that you can see how the problem develops in the process. Like, so you should see your first 50 observations operating fairly normally and then the problem occurring. If I just put my um, observations 51 to 54, you won't get the context. So I'm going to just make my prediction set, I'm going to set all my data, say OK, go from observation 1 up to 54, and include those in my prediction set. So make sure all your observations are selected and included in your prediction set, and then say OK. Everyone following up to that point? You guys are okay? Oh, Charlene, you guys at the back? Yeah. You're, you're okay? You're following? Do we put the last four or no? Yes, you put the last four in your prediction set. Yeah. Okay. Once you've done that, now you let's go take a look at our, our, our monitoring charts. So our monitoring charts are in the score plots, T squared, and these are what we're going to monitor. So let's take a look first at, go to analyze, and then you, you choose score plot. Plot. Sorry? Plot. Uh, no, analyze, and then score plot. In this drop down over here for work set, make sure you select all my data. Rather than training, training is the default which will only be the first 50 observations. Make sure you select all my data, which is in that <coughs> specification we made earlier. T1, T2, add series. You have to click add series and say OK. Observation 51, 52, 53, 54. They're all, here's 54, 53 working backwards. You're seeing this progression outside the plot, going outside the limits. So observation 51 followed by 52, 53, 54. The process, if you're seeing it as a plane, the projection of points 51, 52, 53, 54 is getting further and further away from the model. And the last two points, 53 and 54, are in fact outside the 99% limits. So how, that's the detection part. We've detected the problem. I'm going to show you, we're going to look at the scores, T squared and SP. We'll be able to detect the problem in all three plots. Uh, we just look like right now looking at scores. In fact, let's go look at, at these other two before we try to diagnose the problem. Let's go first look at the detection inside the Fotelling's T-squared. So as before, go analyze Fotelling's T-squared this time. And choose your work set to be all my data. And say OK. Sorry. Yeah. So go to analyze Fotelling's T-squared. And then choose all my data. Be able to generate that. So we were able to detect it on the score plot, and no surprise that we can detect it on the Hotelling's T squared because Hotelling's T squared is just a summary of the scores anyway. Okay. So very clear here what, what's going on. This distance here represents the distance off the model plane. This is the 99% uh, confidence limit for the distance. That's the 99%. These two points are definitely outside the limits there. Uh, sorry, it, you can see the progression of it going further and further on the model plane. Let's take a look finally at SPE. So analyze square prediction error and then all my data, say OK. So this is the distance off the model plane. So point 52, 
33 and 34 are well beyond the 99% limit of the model. One way to visualize this is let's take a case, let's assume though that we only had two components. One way to try and visualize what's going on here is to say in some space T1, T2. Okay, so this is representing my model plane down here, and this distance, the height, represents SPE. The Hotelling's T squared ellipse is really just an ellipse on this plane, but I can't draw this very well, so definitely mess it up. So that's some point on the plane. That's the ellipse projected onto the T1, T2 plane. SPE then represents some height. So it's kind of like a pancake. That's, so this solid line represents the, the ellipse on my plane. There's some certain amount of height off the plane above and below within which we're saying we're accepting movement above and below the plane. So we don't mind as long as our data points lie with inside this, this uh, box given by, there's my upper limit for SPE, there's my lower limit for SPE, and here's my ellipse, which defines the region on the model plane. This defines the region off the model plane. As long as I'm inside this zone, I don't mind. I'm behaving normally as I, as I expect. What's happened here with this data point, 53, 54, 52, we're seeing high SPE and high T squared. So that's an indication that we're seeing something like this kind of launching outside our model. So all the other data points are on our model plane and, and within our upper and lower bounds for SPE. But 52, 53, and 54 are showing high T squared and high SPE. We're going far across the model plane as well as above or, or below. It doesn't matter, SPE is a distance, so it doesn't matter whether it's going up or down. It's still outside the normal bounds. So that's one picture that I, I think will be useful to try and understand what's going on here in this case. Let's, so we've detected the problem. Let's try and diagnose it. If we go back, um, I'm going to go back to my Hotelling's T squared plot for a minute. So make, uh, Open your hotelling's T squared plot or regenerate it with the testing data. And we want to ask now why is this point got a high T squared? Or why is that point got a high T squared? What are the factors in our original data set that caused that, that point to be so far on the model thing? So you can select that point and then use the contribution tool up here to, to answer that question. So the next class, I'll explain how the contributions are calculated. Um, for now, we'll just let the software generate them for us. Okay. And it's telling us the variables most responsible for that movement across the plane are the maximum temperature in the second um, section of the reactor, as well as Z2, the distance along the reactor where that hot spot T max 2 occurs. Okay. Also T out 2 is, is, is slightly different. And these last five variables, remember, are the five lab variables that we've gone and measured afterwards. So those lab variables are different as a result of the problem that occurred in the reactor. So uh, we, we can understand also what's happened to the, to the quality of the product, but we can also go find out why. Okay, and that's, this is where, where um, process monitoring with latent variable methods really works well because we've reduced our problem from having to go look at pressure, flow rates of the initiator and solvents, Z1, Z2, temperatures. We've reduced having to go look through those, all those variables down to just having to really go investigate these uh, two, two variables, maybe three or four. So let's first go investigate Z2. 
That would be the first one. So selecting Z2 then, you just select it with, um, with the cursor and make sure it becomes red. You just click and drag. So just click, drag, and, and highlight it. And then go up to this icon here, create raw data plot. And that will plot your time series of Z2. help you go figure it out. So Z2, what's happened here to the hotspot, the position of the hotspot? So it was Z2 was the distance along the reactor where the, where the temperature peaks. has shifted further down the reactor. So previously it was at around 58% of the distance along the reactor was our normal range of operation. It's, it's shifted out, out, outside that zone. Or shifted further down, further down the reactor. That's it too. We can also go look at what for the other one, uh, T max two, right? So you can leave that plot up and then just change it in the drop down. T max two. T max two. Highlight it and say more data plot. Okay, that's. So the maximum temperature has decreased. Ordinarily it behaves around 280, it's dropped off now to 270 at the end. Okay, so the, 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 let me just put it this way. So once we detect the problem, we've detected the problem in, T, in what time is T squared, we then do the contribution plus to help us diagnose it. The, the contribution plot doesn't actually tell us what the problem is. Okay. It's just showing you the subset of variables to go to look at in order to go use your head and, and your engineering knowledge of the process to go figure out what the problem is. No way will this contribution plot be sufficient to say this is why the fault occurred. We'll never be able to tell you the cause and effect. All it can do is, is highlight the variables you should go investigate yourself. Z2 then and T max 2 were what we just showed then and we, we figured out. Now, this is exactly the same situation we ended up with at the Shuar chart. Right? Earlier I showed you the temperature on the Shuar chart shot up. But there's no, what, what really caused this problem? Why did the temperature shift further down the reactor? Uh, sorry, why did the hot spot shift further down the reactor and why did that temperature drop off? Okay. None of us can tell, right? This is not our process. We, we don't know too much about, well, I, I certainly don't know much about polymer engineering. But this is as far as we can go with these tools, right? You have to then ask your colleagues if I was working in this post and I was an officer, I would try to go ask why, what might cause this? Uh, what changes were made on the process when this problem occurred? These tools, and I can tell you now, there's no software tools on the market that will tell you this is the problem and why it occurred. People will try to sell you software tools that do that, expert systems and similar health monitoring tools, but there's absolutely no tool that will be able to substitute your knowledge for an engineer to figure out, given this pattern in the data for this variable, what caused that problem. Okay? You really have to go and do some investigation. But at least what we've done now is we've eliminated investigating all our, um, I don't know how many variables there are, let's say there's about 15 variables here. We've reduced our, our search to just those two to then try and figure out. In this particular example, the problem was because there was an impurity in the initiator that started to enter the reactor, causing that uh, that problem. So, uh, but again, we would have to know as an engineer if an impurity had to enter my reactor, it might lead to this uh, drop in temperature and a subsequent shift in the hot spot position. But it would, we would never um, have figured that out any other way. Yeah. Um, for whatever reason, there was actually a monitoring chart on that temperature. It would have been detected. 
That's the key, the key point here. So Richard makes a good point here. Right, you're absolutely right. If you go look back at the Z2 <coughs> variable as well as the Tmax2 variable, the univariate monitoring chart would have easily detected that fault. Okay. But the advantage is here we've got one, we've got two monitoring charts, really. We've got an SPE monitoring chart and a T squared monitoring chart. T squared is showing you your distance on the model plane. SPE is showing you your distance off the model plane. And once you detect the problem within these two charts, then you go down to the contributions, and then from the contributions, you can go to the raw data to go investigate the problem. So what some companies do is they try to get away even with one chart. So they take T squared and SPE, and they combine them. They plot SP on the y axis and T squared on the x axis. And this is a great plot to monitor because you're plotting two independent variables. T squared is your distance on the model plane, SP is your distance off the model plane. And you put on here your 95 or 99% T squared limit, it goes here. And you put over here. 95% SPE limit. And you plot it as a scatter plot. So if your process is behaving well, you're in this box here. If a problem occurs that leads you to move on the model plane, but still below the SPE limit, you'll start to move into this direction. You can move off the model plane in that direction. Or you can do both. So the software has that in there for you. You go to analyze and you go SP versus HT squared. So over here, SP versus hotel HT squared, it will plot that joint monetary plot for you. So select uh, all my data then and say OK. see here how the process has shifted. So here's 52, here's 50, 51, I'm not sure where 51 is right now. Uh, it's probably somewhere in here. 52, 53, 54. So we've launched off the model plane and along the model plane. You could do that, yeah. Coming back to Ian's question, you had asked earlier, like, is a point with high T squared really an outline? Uh, you, 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 I think you kind of hinted at it at the beginning. Maybe I'm just reinterpreting the question that way. Uh, you, there were, you could argue that a high T squared value, as long as your SPE is below the limits, you're, so coming back to this diagram, you're on the model plane, but you're just kind of further out, but still within SPE. You could argue, and some people do argue, and I, I tend to agree that that's not really an outlier. It's more a large point where all the variables are still consistent with each other, but just at the, var the values in that vector are slightly higher and lower than normal. But the relationship between the variables is consistent. Remember, SPE is going to pick up for us the case where the relationship between the variables changes. When something between the relationship of the variables that's normally there has been broken. Okay. Let's take uh, point uh, 53 as an example. This has got high SPE. I'm going to see if I, I haven't done this one to verify, but let's take a look at it anyway. So point 53 in the SPE plot, let's see if I can come in over here. Okay, so here's the SPE plot, select point 53, and let's plot the contribution for that. Okay. 
So this is, I'm asking why is 0.53 off the model plane? That's what this part is, is trying to help me answer. It says 0.53 has Z2 and Fi2. So flow rate of the initiator into the second compartment of the reactor, as well as the distance along the second compartment where the hot spot occurs. It says that these two variables have a broken relationship. The relationship that these two variables normally have with each other has changed, okay, which is what causes a, value, a, a vector to be off the model thing. How do we verify that? Let's go take a look, obviously, at the raw data. That's always, I, I strongly recommend you do this. Every time you see a contribution plot, don't just say, stop here, it's say, and say it's due to Z2 and Fi2. What is it about Z2 and Fi2 that's changed? The way you do that in the software is to go plot a custom plot. So go up to analyze, choose custom plot. And under work set, make sure you choose all my data because remember the problem that occurs actually at the point 53, not in the training data set. So all my data, under the range drop down, choose X variables. We want to plot Z2, choose Z2 and say add. So a lot of flex here, so is everyone keeping up with me? And then, Z2 versus Fi2, Fi2, and add that as well. So we've got two, two entries in there. And I click one of them and say set that as x axis. And the most important part is to say all my data. Okay, everyone up to that point? Okay, and then hit OK. Yeah, the relationship between Z2 and Fi2, the normal relationship is that they have a negative correlation. Okay? As, as that hot spot distance increases, the flow rate of the initiator is usually lower than normal. And that, and that makes, makes engineering sense. Okay? As we put in less initiator into the system, that hot spot shifts further and further down the reactor. If we put more initiator into the system, we're going to generate the heat earlier on and that hot spot will move to, to nearer to the front of the reactor. But the fault that's occurred here has broken the relationship between Z2 and Fi2. The normal relationship that exists between these two variables has been broken, which is why we're seeing high SPE values. And 51, 52, 53, 54, those four observations show that broken relationship. In fact, if you go draw, ask for the contributions for all those observations for 52 now, let's just go select 52 and ask for that contribution plot. It gets you the same looking plot. It's also giving you the same information. Point 52 has a broken relationship between those same two variables. Okay, and it would be the same plot for 54. Any, any questions on that? Okay, I thought we would have time to cover the next data set in class. Um, what I will do though is I'm going to introduce it, introduce the data set, and then um, I, I'm happy to stay here for another half hour or so and, and work with any of you that might have questions on it if you've got the energy to go with, keep going. Uh, you don't have to stay. Uh, but this data set is uh, going to be for assignment three. It will be the only data set for assignment three. Now, you might be wondering, like, why am I bombing you with so many assignments? I always do that. If any of you take my other courses, you know at the start of the semester, it's assignment after assignment, and then there's nothing for the rest of the term. And that's because you're going to get overloaded with other courses later on. So I get my chance to, to get you <laughs> and it's downhill after that. And also because the course project comes later on and I'll be expecting you to spend your time working on the course project instead. Uh, so you're going to get a couple of assignments from me right at the beginning and then nothing later on. So assignment three is going to be very straightforward. It, it's actually a really nice data set, uh, very easy to understand. Uh, it's near the, near the end of the slides. 
And I'll, I, will, I will recap these uh, other slides that I skipped over today in the next class, so don't worry about that. Okay, so what's going on here? This data set is from an actual company, it's from Motorola. They're producing silicon wafers to go into uh, some of their technology products. They produce these wafers in a batch that goes into a reactor. Um, so, I'm not very familiar with the semiconductor industry, but from what I do know about this data set, they take a tray and there you've got multiple wafers and so on in a grid. And this tray is inserted inside a chemical vapor decomposition unit. The CVD unit deposits layers after layers after layers and builds up the thickness of this wafer. Um, what they're interested in, the data set that you've got here, is the thickness of these wafers. What they'll do is they'll take one wafer, let's say this one over here, it then goes to the lab and they measure nine thickness values on that one wafer with the assumption that all the other wafers will behave similarly. Measure nine thickness values at those points, this is on one wafer. So your data set's very simple. It's nine columns which represent those thicknesses. And the, the, the assignment's pretty straightforward. Build a PCA model on the first 100 rows. Now actually, what you can go do here if you'd like is build a PCA model on all the data first and then pick out any outliers, exclude those outliers and rebuild the model one. But what I'm going, I arbitrarily split the data into, uh, there's 184 rows. So I'm asking you to use the first 100 rows to build your monitoring model. And then you're going to use the data to check the remaining rows. So build your model on the first 100 rows. You're going to notice some outliers even in those 100 rows. Because we don't know. We're getting this data set from Motorola. We have no idea when they were behaving normally or not. So we're going to bootstrap our monitoring model up. Remember, monitoring models must be built on data where everything's under normal behavior. We don't know where normal behavior is. So we're going to iterate and find normal behavior. Build a model, detect outliers, exclude the outliers, rebuild the model. See outliers maybe again, exclude those outliers a second round, rebuild, and hopefully by the third or fourth time we've cleaned up our data set so that now we don't have 100 rows anymore, we maybe have, let's say, 90. I don't know what the right number is. Okay. So 90 odd rows of normal data. We've excluded unusual observations and we've moved it. And I don't want you just to go blindly exclude. When you detect an outlier here, go look at the contribution for T1 and T2 or for SPE, however you detect the outlier. So it's a very open-ended assignment. You could have detected the outlier in the score plot, the SPE plot, Hotelling's T squared maybe. Pick up the outliers, describe why it's an outlier in your opinion, exclude it, and rebuild the model. Okay. So that by the time you get to step six, you've got a data set where it's perfectly clean, normal operating conditions. First component for the loadings. I want you to give me an interpretation of what that first component is doing. I want you to uh, uh, given the R squared and Q squared values for the first component, what do you interpret about the variability in the process? Okay, so remember PCA is explaining variability in the data. What does that first component mean? And you need to compare it against its R squared value to, this one, to identify it. Um, I want you to interpret P2. And then I want you to plot a time series plot for T1. So this is all on just the training data, right? That first hundred odd rows. Uh, so plot me a time series plot for T1. Do you notice any patterns in that data? Do the same for T2. Now go and use all the data as testing data. So all 184 observations, of which we built the model on the roughly the first hundred. But now you're going to use all the data as testing. Those outliers that you excluded earlier, they should show up here, right? They should, 
right? That, they were outliers the first time around. They should definitely be outliers now on this cleaned up data set. Make sure that those outliers you excluded show up, as well as any outliers in the 84 rows that you hadn't seen before. So those 84 rows, the 100, the 84, these are totally new. This is like you're monitoring online in a, in a company. You built your model, let's say the 100 rows are data from 2010, and let's say the 84 rows are from 2011 onwards. So pretend that those 84 rows are the new data you're going to detect in an online monitoring system. Pick out any outliers and try to diagnose what those outliers are. Okay, so a very open-ended assignment. I don't want I don't want lots of pages of plots and stuff. I'm really more interested in you. You don't have to give a plot for everything either, right? Just describe what your thinking is and, and your interpretation. That's more what I'm after. But it, it's there's a lot of freedom here. Okay, so. I'm